So before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal clan of the Eora Nation, which is the area, the Aboriginal area where I am today, the country that I'm coming to you from. And I'd also like to acknowledge the country where you are today as well. And of course, Aboriginal people, both traditional and current Aboriginal people, I'm sure, are very aware of the importance of pollinators and our native Australian animals and the relationship they have with each other. So that's a really important thing to uh, recognise and remember. So just to remind you, we are in a class. I'm the principal of a school and my teachers will be teaching you today. And so we are following Department of Education Behaviour Code, which means we value your kindness and your positive participation. So there are some things where you can participate for your safety, your online safety, um, you won't be able to turn your microphone or camera on. Um, also today, there's um, the Q&A and the chat has been turned off. But if you have any question that you want to ask about the webinar that you might not have understood, there's a chance for you at the end um, on a, an evaluation to write down the question and we will answer that on the website. Okay, so you can go back to that website and have a look at that shortly. Okay, so I'm going to put up our first um, poll because it's always good for us to get information about you. And again, if you are a teacher, you might want to fill this in for your class. So the qu first question is, are you a student, a teacher or other? And if you are a teacher, I'd like you to put teacher there so that we can see. Uh, the second question is, what year are you in? And if you're a teacher, you might tell us what class you have in front of you. And then the third question is, what are you interested in learning about? And the last question is, how many people are watching with you today? So for teachers, you could just put your class total in there. That would be fantastic. Okay, so it would be obviously um, more than four there. All right. So thanks guys for answering the poll today. That gives us a lot of great information. It's always good that we know a little bit about you before we get started. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. I'll just give you a couple more seconds to answer our poll and then we'll keep moving on. Now today, Nicole is going to be telling you all about the important role that plants play as uh, part of pollination and how there's a relationship between those plants and those animals that are pollinators. We're also going to be uh, looking at a model of how pollination works and we're going to look at some great um, artwork or craft that you can do using natural materials. Okay, so I'm going to end that poll now um, and share our results. Okay, so it looks like about half of you are teachers, which is fantastic. So thank you teachers for joining with your class. Uh, most of you are in year three or four or year five and six. Uh, everybody is interested in animals, as are we, which is fantastic. And um, some of you are just by yourself and some of you are with your class. Thanks so much. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing that there and we're going to move on. So now I'm gonna hand over, oh no, I'm not, sorry. Before I hand over to Nicole, I'm just gonna show you that um, if you are interested in more about biodiversity and pollinators, you can find out on our online learning page on the Observatory Hill Environmental Education Center website. If you click online learning, you will find where all the information is. Okay, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later on. Okay, so now I am going to hand over to Nicole, who's going to be um, telling us all about the fascinating world of plants and pollination. So thanks, Nicole. Thanks so much, Glenn, and welcome everybody. It's great to be with you on a Friday afternoon. So I'm excited for today because we're taking a bit of a deeper dive into pollination. 
as Glenn said, this is number four in a series. So earlier on, I'm not sure if you managed to catch it, we did talk a lot about pollination, pollinators, plants, and how important they are in our environment. But many of you asked some great questions about actually how does it all work? So we're going to be looking really closely now at the relationship between pollination and reproduction. So how important it is to have these pollinators doing this critical work without which, as we learned, well, you may already know there wouldn't be many of the foods that we enjoy eating, as well as fibres, but also healthy environments for all of our important animals. This picture here is a really nice detailed picture looking inside a flower. So that's what we call a cross section where we can see inside the flower. And so pollination, as, we, as I said, is a very important part of the cycle of a flowering plant. So we're focusing on flowering plants and without pollination, these flowering plants would not be able to produce the seeds and then of course, then their fruits. So we really need this opportunity to connect between the flower, flower being there and as we learned before they they welcome pollinators in a number of different ways through color shape and size and flowering time of the year they're doing all that to attract a particular pollinator to help them to reproduce or make more of themselves so we're looking inside the flower here at all of those critical elements of the flower the male cells are found inside the tiny pollen grains on the anther of the flower, so they're all well labeled there, the anther. And the female cells, the gam or gametes, are found in the ovules of a flower. So pollination is how one, the male cells, join up with the female cells. So if it wasn't for those pollinators moving that pollen from flower to flower, that reproduction would just not be able to happen. And we can see also in this image, after fertilization, what happens next? And we have that development of the seed, which can turn into another flower or fruit. So moving to our next one, another image just to help us understand the role of pollinators in this important work. We can see here an example of a European honeybee moving from flower to flower. And as they're doing that, they are moving pollen with them. Now, of course, we know bees aren't the only pollinators. We will revisit that, so don't worry if you're thought they actually were our only pollinators. They're not our only pollinators, but they are an animal that has developed a way of carrying pollen on their leg sacs, particularly as they're moving from flower to flower. And they use that pollen to take home to their families and feed babies and make their hive nice and healthy, all sorts of things. But it's a good example showing you how they're going from one flower and taking that from the, um, the one part of the one flower to the stigma of the other from the anther as we can see on the left to the stigma on the right. And that is that critical movement of that pollen to then enable all the processes that need to happen for fertilization and reproduction. Now, as I mentioned, pollinators are, our, are responsible for pollination. So there are some ways that plants can spread their seeds without pollinators, but most of them actually do need pollinators. And then the biggest group of pollinators actually are insects. So that's really interesting to know too. Often the pollinators are going to the flower really for a nice sweet drink of nectar. And the flower has developed really clever ways of depositing or putting pollen onto that animal that will then fly off or move away to another flower where that pollen will fall off into that other flower. So we call that like an incidental instead of purposeful pollination, as opposed to where we were talking about the bees before who are actively gathering that pollen on their body to take with them. So we can see here also another example of wind being a pollinator. Of course, there are birds that are pollinators as well. And as they're moving around from flower to flower, they're spreading those critical cells of the male to find the other flower with the female components where they can join and reproduce to make more of themselves. Glenn, I see we have a poll there about animal pollinators. I'll let you run that. Thanks, Nicole. So I'm just going to put that poll up for you now and have a see if you can pick the pollinator. Okay, so there it is. It should be up on your screen now. So from all of those choices, and they are multiple choice 
questions. Can you pick which ones of those things are pollinators? So I know Nicole just mentioned some of them. Okay. So don't forget it can be a multiple choice. If you change your mind, you can stop it and go to a different one. So have a think about all those different animals and other things. Which ones of those are pollinators? All right, looks like most people have finished. I'll just give you a couple more seconds to finish that off. Just run your eyes down that list and click the ones that you think are pollinators. All right, now, Nicole, I'm going to end our poll now and I'm going to share those results with everybody. All right, so let's have a look at those results, guys. And Nicole, do you want to mention something about these results? Thanks, Glenn. Yeah, that's really fantastic. Well done, everybody. I can see some very careful thinking going on there. And it's really interesting to see to your, your knowledge about our different pollinators. Absolutely. We have a few there that most people wouldn't realize are pollinators. We even have our nocturnal pollinator or one or a couple of the nocturnal pollinators being bats and moths. So well done. That's fantastic. You know that. And as we said in one of our earlier sessions, wind and people can help to move pollen. Of course, again, that would be something you'd call incidental, wasn't intentional. But I want you to have a think about the incredible variety, and that was a word we were using a lot, the variety of different pollinators. And then when we understand our flowers that have been developed over millions of years and their relationship with these pollinators, how we have that incredible variety of flowers to attract the variety of pollinators and vice versa. So that's fantastic, Glenn. I'm so impressed. They've done great. Well done, everyone. So here we are, some fantastic uh, pictures and beautiful evidence of animals moving from flower to flower and collecting this pollen. On the previous slide, we saw a beautiful butterfly covered in pollen. So that was really lovely, what a sight. And here we can see, of course, a bee on the left our bat up in the middle, which I have to say, I think that's my favorite picture. You rarely get to see that. Beetles and birds. So as you can see, as they're coming in for a nice sweet drink, the flower is spreading their pollen all over that animal. And when they continue to fly off to another flower, that pollen is falling off their bodies as they're going in for another drink and starting the process of reproduction through pollination. So I thought you'd like to see those photos of some great examples of pollinators that are all around us. We're going to be crossing over to Tristan now, which is really exciting. I love when she shows us this model of pollination. Over to you, Tristan. Okay. Hi, guys. We're here at my place. I've come inside again this week because today, last week it was raining. This week it's hot and windy, and that's not going to work for my pollination model. So I've come inside again today, and I wanted to show you what I've created to show you how pollination works. So Nicole's given us lots of great information there about pollination, and I created a model flower. So you can see my model flower has beautiful petals, and inside we have the stigma, which, or the pistil, including the stigma at the top there, which as Nicole told us was the male part. And then we have the stamens on the outside, which are the female part, and they will actually contain or hold the pollen. I've got a flower here with pollen. So my model flower with my petals and my stamens here and my anthers are covered in pollen. My pollen is actually made out of flour. So don't panic, I haven't stolen any bees pollen. Now, as well as that, to show you how this works, I've created a beautiful butterfly today. So as a model, you can see it has the body parts, two sets of wings. We can see a head. We can see three body parts, antenna. I can see little legs there. And I know that my, my butterfly is going to be searching for nectar. So Nicole spoke about an incidental pollinator. And when we see our 
butterfly flying into my flower searching for nectar, it accidentally might rub against those anthers. And I'm not sure if you can see there, it's difficult to see. Can you see that my little butterfly now has pollen on its face? Okay. Can you see him or her flying away? She might end up on another flower and you'll notice as she's moving around, and this is tricky to see, you can see that some of that pollen now has rested onto the stigma and therefore pollination has occurred. Now, you might be asking what about bees? And Nicole spoke about bees, so of course I've got a model bee here. We can see our two sets of wings again, my antenna. On my bee, its back set of legs actually may capture the pollen and we know that bees will actually use pollen to feed or to set up their nests. So bees are actually capturing nectar, so the liquid, but also pollen and they make a mixture of nectar and pollen to actually feed baby bees. So that's what they put into the honey cone or into the cone when those bees are eggs and larvae and pupae, that's what they're feeding on. So when my bee goes into my model flower, you can see him buzzing around, or her, I should say, because we know those bees are hers, buzzing around, collecting nectar and pollen. You can see again, her face has got a little bit of pollen on it there. She's going to fly into the next flower. And as she's buzzing around, she's actually depositing some pollen onto the stamen there of the flower. So we can see that is how, sorry, the stigma, I should say, of the flower. That is how pollination occurs. I'm gonna go back over to you, Nicole, thanks. Thanks, Tristan, that's so fantastic. Well done. I'm gonna try and make one as good as you this afternoon. So we can see now, if we're looking over to the next slide when it comes up, <clears throat> Again, looking at that same cross section of the flower, but now to understand that only after pollination, so only after those animals like the butterfly and the bee have come and moved that pollen over, the pollen has landed on the stigma of the flower and then a chain of events, it's like flicking a switch, starts to happen that ends up in the making of seeds. So that's where we can see the critical role these pollinators play in making that happen. So the pollen grain on the stigma will then grow a tube all the way down to the style, to, on the, down the style to the ovary. And we can see there a, a larger picture of the ovary with the ovules or the eggs inside. So now we can understand through this cross section how really a simple passage that is but that cannot start to happen, that process cannot happen without the pollen being moved there first by pollinators. So pretty amazing relationship. We've got this image here again, <clears throat> which we were talking about before, when we can now understand that the fertilized ovule goes on then to form the seed, as we can see, and it's a lovely, we can see very clearly there what a beautiful cycle that is. And it contains a food store and embryo that will later grow into the new plant. And the ovary is the one that develops into fruit, which is protecting the seed. So it's a lovely, clear picture and explanation of how the process then continues once fertilization has happened. So it gives us a greater appreciation, I think, not only of our flowers, but all the incredible seeds and fruits that we get to enjoy, with all thanks to the pollinators. We're going to have a bit of a closer look and understanding then, looking at them, I'm sure, in a different way than you would have before, at some fruit, at some fruits with seeds inside. So we can see here, this is showing us that some flowers, like the avocado, only have one ovule in their ovary, so their fruit only has one seed. But there are other flowers, like a kiwi fruit flower, that have lots of ovules in their ovary, so their fruit contains many seeds. Or well, the passion fruit here is the same example. So when you're now looking inside any of these foods that you're about to eat, it really helps you to understand all the process that has gone into making that incredible food that we're lucky enough to get to eat. Here we have uh, oops, uh, some pictures of three different seeds. 
And I think we're going to be running a poll now, Glenn, to test our students to see which ones they think are which. Over to you. Sorry, yep, so I've launched that poll now. Um, you should be able to see three different seeds, seed one, seed two, and seed three. So do you know which plant each one of those seeds comes from? Okay, so you've got three questions, seed one, seed two, and seed three. I'm sure you guys are clever enough to work out which one. I think Nicole's already shown us one of them. And I'm sure you would have seen the other ones, maybe in your dinner, maybe in the supermarket, maybe if you grow some plants in your garden. Sometimes it's a little bit tricky to work out from the seed what sort of plant it's going to grow into. All right, so it looks like most people have had a go there. So let's end that poll and let's have a look at our results. All right, so the first one, seed number one, the really big one, this is an avocado, okay? And if you cut an avocado open, you'd know that there's a great big thing looks almost like a wooden ball inside there and that's the seed. The second seed are pumpkin seeds. Okay, quite a lot of you got pumpkin seeds. And the last one are of course the watermelons. Okay, so if you cut a watermelon, you got a slice of it, you've got all those little black seeds, which most people pull out and throw away. But of course, you can plant them and turn them into new watermelons. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing that one there and I'm going to pass on to Nicole again. And there we go. Thanks, Glenn. And well done, everybody, again. I knew we were dealing with a very clever bunch here today. Uh, it's really nice, I think, to take the time to have a closer look and a think about what we're eating and all the work that's gone into what we're eating and how different, again, the variety of things that we get to eat. So I thought it would be really helpful to show you some plants from seed to fruit so that now you have that understanding of how the cycle of it all works and what's gone into making those seeds. And some of these you may not have seen before or even thought about before. I know some people get surprised by some of them as we move on, I'll take you through. This first slide here, we're looking at the tomato seeds they grow to the flower in the middle, that little yellow flower. And then of course they become the fruit, but they can't do that until a pollinator has come to the flower to help to spread the pollen and start the process of reproduction. Again, down the bottom here is our pumpkin and we've got the seeds on the left, the flower in the middle and the pumpkin on the right. I will say, and some of you may have noticed in some of your gardens, if you've done growing or at school, how many of these uh, fruits we're familiar with have yellow flowers. And then when we start to look at things like zucchinis and cucumbers, of course, how similar they are too. So that's the, those two there. And the other couple here, of course, our watermelon. I wanted to pick this one to show you because I don't know that many people stop to think about how watermelons actually grow. So I thought this was a really nice image to share of the watermelon there right next to a flower growing on the ground. Of course, far too heavy to be growing on a tree. And then of course, there's the fruit and there's a banana underneath. So that's one that I know always surprises everybody what a banana flower looks like. And it's just absolutely magnificent. And the way they grow is really also incredible. So it's definitely given a much, me a much greater appreciation of bananas, that's for sure. And the next time you cut one up, you can have a close look at those tiny black seeds and wonder how it is that that will grow into the banana plant and the banana flower and start the process all over again. So even small seeds can grow into something really, really big and complex. And lastly, here also another couple that I thought were interesting, of course, apples, I think we're all pretty familiar with growing again, the apple blossom there in the middle down the bottom and the apple on the tree, the fruit, but above it is papaya. So the seeds, which are actually quite wet uh, and small-ish and growing into the flower there in the middle. And then that's how they grow on a tree, which is really interesting because they can get quite heavy. So I thought these were some really good examples to show you to just have a think again about what it takes to grow these fruits and what might be growing around you that you actually were never sure what it was. And now you will know a little bit better. We're going to go back over to Tristan 
and see what she's going to be making with things from her garden. Over to you, Tristan. Hi, Nicole. I have to say my favorite seeds at the moment are definitely watermelon seeds because I am thoroughly enjoying the watermelon. But have you ever considered some of the other things that have seeds? And it's not just people that actually benefit from those seeds. I was doing a little bit of collecting in my garden, as Nicole mentioned, and I found a lot of different things, which we're going to do some ephemeral art with shortly. But I was thinking about actually the Banksia here. Did you see this one? They have such interesting seed pods. And I've noticed, have you ever noticed, that sometimes you see the cockatoos actually breaking open these seed pods to get the seed out of those, which is pretty amazing, I think. So sometimes we have those relationships between the animals and the plants, which help the plants to disperse their seeds. I know next week we're going to talk about one of Glenn's favourite seed dispersers. I'm not going to give it away, Glenn, but we'll be talking about that next week, won't we? Now, of course, what I've done is I've collected all my goodies here from my backyard and as I've been walking around in the afternoon, and I'm going to create a pollinator. So I'm going to start with using some of the things. I've got this great Banksia pod, different one. So I've got a variety of Banksias near my place. I found these great leaves just this morning. They've come straight off my avocado tree. I'm going to pop those ones in. I think they'll be my leaves. I'm definitely going to make a butterfly today, I think. I've got three sets of legs because I'm only looking at it from the, from the side. So three sets would be six in total. I'm going to put a plant and I think I pinched some flowers today because I think my butterfly would love to be looking at these flowers which were in my garden. So you can see now I have my butterfly made out of the things that I'd found in my garden. I've created a plant for him to be collecting pollen or collecting nectar and accidentally collecting pollen. And I think I've got a great picture. I might take a photo of that when I finish and I'll put it up on the website. Maybe you could collect some items from your yard. Remember, don't pick them from plants that are living, but really just pick them up off the ground. They're the best ones to take. And see if you can collect something and show us some artwork of a pollinator that you might have seen in your yard. Okay, guys, I'm going to go back over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Tristan. Okay, so I'm just going to show everybody where you can upload all the fantastic artworks that you might make. So those ephemeral, which means only lasting a short time, um, obviously have been made out of natural materials that Tristan had around her house. And I'm sure you've got lots of things around your house or even around your school that you could make some ephemeral artwork. And then you can photograph it and you can send it to us so that everybody else can see it. And you can send it to us via our website. So remember I showed you the Observatory Hill Environmental Education Centre. It's a very long name for a school. And if you go to our website, have a look at the online learning button. If you press that, you will come to the biodiversity and pollinators tile. And if you click that, then you will see this web page with all the information about all the different sessions, as you can see, and there's a gallery tab. So if you click into the gallery tab up the top there, then that's where you can upload your work. And you can see there's a button there that says share my work and you can upload that to us so that we can put it on the website for everybody else to see. Um, if you are in a non-government school, a private school, then there's information about how you can share that with us. You can just email that to us and we will upload it ourselves. Okay, so I think that's about it. There is, um, th this is the form that you fill in to upload your work and you can see down the bottom there, it says add your file. So you can send any of your work to us from any of the sessions and um, we will put it on our website for everybody else to see. So don't forget that this is the fourth um, se uh, session in a series of six webinars. Next week, we'll be talking about my favourite pollinator, as Tristan said, and uh, you might find some information on our website about that. We're also recording these sessions, so um, there will be eventually 
the six sessions recorded. So perhaps for teachers, if you wanted to go back over any of the, the first three, which we actually did um, last term, you can have a look at those as well. So there'll be one next week at four, uh, sorry, 1.30 on Friday, and our last one will be the week after. All right, that will be our last one for this term. Okay, so as we finish today, and I'll just stop sharing my screen, uh, when we finish this webinar, there's going to be a short evaluation pop-up. If you can answer that for us, and don't forget if you had any questions that you didn't understand from the webinar, you can also write them on the evaluation that's going to pop up there now, okay? So um, that's it for us. We hope that you have a great weekend. Please stay safe out there. Great to see so many people back at school with their teachers. And hopefully we can see you next Friday at 1.30 on the same link. Okay, but for now, it's bye from us at Observatory Hill Environmental Education Centre. All right, so thanks, guys. See you.